Now we're good. Great. Damn technology. Um, okay, hello everybody. Lovely to see you. Lovely to uh, work with you for this whole week on a subject that is very close to my heart. <laughs> so it is drawing. And drawing is, let's say, my main field of interest. And I would like to share with you a different perspective on drawing, uh, a different way of thinking about drawing as a method of uh, exploring, analyzing, re researching any, any task, any object, any uh, issue given to you. So, uh, we decided, I mean I decided, that this lecture is going to be a reading session because uh, I want you to follow my train of thoughts, I want you to follow the text, and the slides. So, isolated space, open gesture. What is this workshop about? <clears throat> so this workshop is about an unusual perspective that drawing can offer to you as a cognitive ability method, as a test method in analyzing reality around you and its objects. And of course, this lecture is going to, to, to uh, is based on this text, but as well, there will be some additional comments from me or Anya during the, during the workshop. And I think that if Anya will say anything right now, you will be able to hear her because my mic is, has a quite wide range. So, okay, Anya. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so you can hear Anya. Great. But you cannot hear uh, other people. But, but for now, you don't, you, don't, you don't have to. Oh, okay. Is, is the quality okay? Should we fix this report? Uh, yes. uh, yes. Okay, we good. Okay, to be precise, when I say cognitive ability or test method, I mean that through drawing, through its characteristics, its nature, you can explore the potential of any given thing. Of course, it has its limitations, but combined with other testing methods and studying, it might allow you to develop an additional perspective. That, of course, might be helpful to, to show the wider range of the problem that you are tackling, that you are analyzing, that you are facing, and that you want to uh, explore. Due to that, a much larger picture of the studied object matter and an opportunity for its broader understanding. I would say that it is about awareness and careful observation. And it's a very important thing that I want you to, to focus now focus now on, uh, that you are aware of making yourself more sensitive, but not through emotions, but through the rigidity of line and through its, though, though its simplicity. So what I mean by that is that in, very often we are uh, focusing on uh, our emotions, our way of looking, our subjective way of perception, etc., etc. But drawing is a neutral space that is unifying those experiences, those sensations. It's unifying them in a form of a single line. It's a more of an abstract way of thinking, but I think that we will get, get, get to that. So our goal here is to give you an opportunity to experience and explore a different way of thinking about drawing. That a line can be drawn not only on a piece of paper, but it can materialize on a specific object, on a wall, in an enclosed space, and an open space, outside space, for example. That you can outline a specific area and equip it with meaning through the act of drawing and the context of the environment you are drawing in. Secondly, we'd like to give you some insight into the nature of drawing by analyzing and mentioning some of the most significant artists and their practice from the history of art and contemporary art. So you will be able to relate and find an anchor for your reflections and afterthoughts about drawing, about what drawing is and may become in your practice or design process during these workshops and of course in the future. Now saying all of that, let's start our short lecture about the introduction to drawing as a way of thinking step by step. First, I'd like to show you that drawing plays a massive role in art's origin. So when we think about drawing, we need to realize that drawing was at the very beginning of art and it's present in almost every myth about its origins. And I would like to share with you a few. Uh, and the first is the most common to refer to. Is there any additional comment I wanted to add? I guess not. Let's see the picture. 
Okay, the first one. Um, according to the Roman historian Pliny the Elder, Tibutada, daughter of a Corinthian potmaker Budadis, fell in love with a young man. When the young man decided to, that he had to leave on a far journey, Tibutada decided to outline his shadow that she noticed on the wall. There is a different version that the young man uh, headed for a, for a war, but it's just a uh, uh, war knowing fact. Uh, seeing his daughter in despair after her love had set for the journey, loving father sculpted a portrait relying on a sketch that she made to comfort her. And this is one of the most uh, well-known myths about the origins of art, and uh, it's the origin to painting, to sculpture and architecture and everything. So in this origin myth, this, the, the center, uh, the center uh, element is the drawing itself. So we may assume that drawing, painting and sculpture origins from a feeling of love that was so strong, it creates the deep desire of maintaining the present, something or rather, in this case, somebody's existence to depict a lasting image that we can preserve and keep with ourselves. However, it's just, it's, it is just an imitation of the original, only a shadow. Some kind of emptiness and longing that is encrypted in human nature leads us in the direction of searching and consequently in the act of creation, which in reality is just an afterimage, a blurred memory of loss. Tolstoy all the way. <laughs> Inside joke. Sorry for that. From a, it's, maybe I can uh, 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 maybe not encrypt it, but uh, de decrypt it. Uh, yeah. A little bit more. Um, what I mean by that, because it's one of the versions of the of the uh, of the interpretation of that myth that I found, but I agree with it a, a little bit, is that there is some kind of a strange urge in us let's say in the people that focus on, on creative aspects etc and it's very difficult to define it and this myth serves a role as a as a more or less a metaphor that can visualize and uh, specify those strange sometimes abstract feelings so in 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 those sometimes in cliched uh, uh terms like love etc longing uh, 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 and after and me memory of loss, but those are those 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 should be treated more as a metaphor, as a vessel, as a carrier of idea that can help you understand what we are tackling here. So, from a formal point of view, and this is the the aspect that is the most interesting for me, uh, from a formal point of view, what happened here was a manifestation of disparity, a difference. A single continuous line is drawn on any surface, in this particular case, a wall divides it and at the same time exposes its inner potential which binds the surface and the line inseparably as an image this is like a, some kind of a phenomenon very simple very 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 but at the same time very strange that while we are acting while there's this act of drawing on a piece of paper on a wall there's going to be an example of drawing on a wall uh, there is this phenomenon that suddenly it becomes more spacious it becomes we, 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 with this act we create a very specific space uh, and it is i would even say almost magical is not the best world but there is some kind of a, there is some kind of a strange uh, uh, paradox that flat surface suddenly becomes spacious that's how i would put it uh, and at that moment we can notice in individual elements though this line and the surface coming together for the differences of the line and the surface, their, their contradictory features, we associate them as a compl complementary whole, an image, a visual image and information. And here we have a, a different version of the, of the myth with uh, Dibutadoe, when she, Dibutadoe coming to visit her lover's portraits. So that's a funny, funny version that I haven't seen before and I found it and I, did, and I said I would share it with you. The next myth is a little bit less tragic. It's more about the ability to observe and act in response to the found circumstances. So on, on a sunny day, a shepherd was pasturing his sheep. Suddenly he decided to outline one of his sheep's shadow on the ground, creating a drawing of a shadow of the sheep. Of course, there are different versions of this myth in this particular uh, example, you see that the, the shepherd is outlining his own uh, shadow, 
but uh, the most common one was is with, with outlining the, the shadow of the sheep. And the shepherd act uh, is puzzling when we think about it in terms of drawing as an artistic mean. Observation and reaction. We may consider it as a sketch, a quick notation of an observed phenomenon. Still, referring to its much more recent contemporary art context, this, this act was more telling and meaningful, I would say. The thing that occurs is a realization of a borderline of the act of drawing, a line that is cutting through the surface, more or less the same thing that we were talking earlier, but let's, let's rephrase a little bit. A line that is cutting through the surface, divides it and shows the depth and space of a single plane. Now, think about it as a thought experiment. Does line performed in space show us the flatness of space? Let's twist uh, the, the situation here. That, for example, when you are drawing, imagine that you can draw in space. So now when you draw a line in space, does it make it more flat? Can it create visual information about space? And I would like to leave you with that question for now. So next, I would like to give you some examples of specific practices that stand out and are a significant reference point for us in the following week's prospect. And I will just briefly mention Lascaux cave paintings for the sake of this lecture, as I mentioned, that drawing on a wall, etc. Uh, as an anthropological rather than mythological example, which might be considered as a more objective way of thinking about the origins of art or craft, but debatable. Uh, but mostly what you can see... <laughs> I'm on, all on Lascaux's side. <laughs> but mostly what you can see is what we already spoke about. The foundation of those depictions is a subtle interplay of qualities of the line and the surface on which they are produced. And this can be particularly visible in Altamira. Of course. Yeah. Of course, it is worth mentioning that those primitive artists, though looking at those masterfully performed paintings, it's hard to accept the term primitive. They were fully aware of the surface they painted on and use it to their advantage. The cave walls, bumps and distortions are used as a supporting feature in some of those images. And this is also an, uh, a key element, uh, uh, an important aspect for you, that when you think about space, of course, it's empty, right? But how you can use this quality, how you can produce, how you can how you can draw a line through a, through empty space. That's as a, in form of a challenge, of course. There is no method, there is no equation that will give you a simple answer. It's not it's not like that. Okay, jumping jumping a little bit further in the history, and just to give you the context, let me show you some less well-known examples of drawings and sketches from artists who were acclaimed as the advocates of disegno. Again, worth mentioning that the word design, which we use so casually in the graphic design field, comes from the Italian word disegno, which directly translates to drawing. Worth knowing. Uh, the significance of drawing was so cherished that every artist in the Renaissance was obliged to master it, but not every one of them gained the title of an apostle, an advocate of drawing. Two artists have widely have been widely acclaimed the title Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo Buonarroti. So first we see Leonardo's sketches. Of course, everybody knows Mona Lisa and all the other paintings, but not everyone is aware of the sketching process that Leonardo focused on. We know his sketchbooks about the, the, his machines, etc. But here, these works are more on the side of visual exploration, searching, and the process of analyzing, which I should have put here the form, of analyzing the, the human form. For example, the, the human anatomy, composition, or even architecture in the, in the next slide, you will see what, what I mean. And I would like to highlight the character of those sketches, the expression of the line captured in this amalgamation of forms and constant movements, that there is a shimmering over them. The expression of the line captured in the amalgamation of forms and traces where the actual shape is looking for itself. That I think that this might be a useful term for you, that when you think about it, that the dynamic aspect of layer upon layer of lines that there's there's a shape looking for itself that there's a shape that is trying to establish itself in the plane of a surface or in space for them and this example is one of my favorite actually this is also leonardo but here the structure the texture of the of the draw of the drawing is so dense that we almost cannot distinguish where's the baby jesus where's the modern, modern but not, we can associate 
which had this wish, but we cannot, it's like everything merges into one form. And this is for me like mind blowing for Renaissance. Okay, so uh, <laughs> for Renaissance artists and, and sketching. Uh, of course, Michelangelo is focused much more on the aspect of anatomy, but we can see in the sketch on the right, a strange coincidence, probably not intended by the artist himself. Still, when the realm of drawn human anatomy that we can see meets his sketches about architecture, some kind of a projection of a building or a mechanism, probably a building, I would say, and symmetry, we start to look for connections, those visual metaphors that feed our imagination, that by this, that by this juxtaposition of those two elements, like an almost an abstract shape, but re referring to a very specific thing, a building, and very specific uh, uh, depiction of human body, there are some, there are some, uh, there are some metaphors that we can try to read and interpret and feed on, I would say. And just a brief example of, of Michelangelo's uh, uh, sculpting process and sculpting works. In Michael, Michelangelo's sculptures, we can observe a peculiar synthesis of his drawing research. That, that's my point of view. Uh, he combined intense study of fragmented human anatomy and the raw natural structure of the stone block. He even described this technique which he used in sculpture as non, non finito. And he, he probably was one of the first uh, that used that consciously, I would say, that he 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 left those those parts of the stone. Of course, gradually with age, when he got older, he was he was suffering uh, with uh, with blindness, etc. So probably he used that for he used that for his advantage, but just a fun fact. <laughs> Okay, now jumping again a little bit further on our timeline to contemporary art practices. We will start with an artist who gained worldwide recognition recent, recently, but died in 1973. Václav Spakovsky mostly, mostly worked as an architect and engineer, but in his free time, somehow detached from his everyday work, began to explore the potential of the line in geometrical and infinite sequences. And I would like, and I wanted to share with you, especially Spakovsky's uh, artistic practice because he's not so well known, and I think that it's worth knowing this this artist because there are some interesting points and interesting works that he did. Uh, so I want to highlight his works as an example of an extreme concept with a simple and pure idea and even one rigid line which flows endlessly in a mathemat mathematical pattern, the potential of infinity is enclosed in a single fragment of a seemingly decorative design, which is established through ruthless mathematical order and a masterful steady hand of the artist. And yes, this is one single line. And uh, another fun fact, Spakovsky, when he was asked about, his, asked about this, these works, he uh, and he he proposed that the viewer should follow the line at a very close distance that almost like sticking his face into the drawing that he follows the line all those let's call them corridors and angles uh, which which are encrypted in the in this work rhythmical lines because that's the title which the artist left us with functions as a simple structure of a complex and constant, almost fractal-like flow. We can describe it as a dynamic of movement captured in the stillness of a single line. That's what, how I, would, I guess I would put it. The, the versatility of his work is based on his direct idea. It resonates with decorative patterns of ancient Greeks, Meander, for example, and the never-ending technological grids and web development. Spakovsky, through his strict method, delivers a metaphor for the human condition in a constant flux. And uh, that maybe that's a little bit over the top, but that's what I think. Maybe I would disagree. Mm -hmm. But my point, my point to mention Spakovsky is, on one hand, to show you that there's this kind of audience. He's, he's very interesting in terms of his practice. And the other is that I want you to think gradually about detaching the drawing, the line from the surface of the paper, because from now on we will we will move to, to actual space. But Spakovsky as a reference point might be useful for you. There are some 
some text that you can look up uh, in, uh, in the internet that, can, that might help you understand even more Spakovsky's work and of course re research his work because he, he done a lot. So and I think that when you're looking for a while at this particular drawing, you can already see it as an isometric perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah of course. So that's the optical uh, impact on us. Yeah. It's a flat drawing. And again, wow. yeah, and again, the, the simplicity enhances and supports that impact even, even, even more, in my opinion. And uh, another. Uh, uh, fun fact, during one of the recent exhibitions of Spakovsky's work, the curator decided to transfer some of his drawings directly to the wall, which allowed him to, and maybe allowed uh, the, the works, to activate and take over the gallery's actu actual space. So it wasn't Spakovsky's intention to work in such a way, but I think that he would accept this, this kind of... Liked it. <laughs> yeah, a lot. <laughs> Uh, I was, and it would be fascinating to see what he would do, do with that. But again, we have those fragmented pieces and we can, I think, with our imagination, see what, what, what the, the potential. And that's, the, in my opinion, also the key element of Spakovsky's work, that he's focused on a fragment that can show you the, the whole potential of infinite patterns uh, revolving. Through this transition, Spakovsky's rhythmical lines manifested fully as an independent entity that we as viewers interact with and follow it, and we can follow its path. Now, referring to examples of artworks that fully activate and liberate the act and the gesture from the plane's conventional flat surface, we need to mention Marcel Duchamp and Yves Klein. Those are just, of course, we analyzed those two artists from the vast library of the history of art and contemporary art. I picked those two because I think that you can find uh, their work as an approach of a well-known, established, uh, well-researched uh, artistic practice. And, as a, and those works are not the fundamentals of their practice, but they are a part of it. So it can give you a broader understanding of, 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 their, uh, of them as, as an artist. So many critics and art theorists describe Marcel Duchamp as a revolutionary, as an artist who flipped the artwork upside down and changed it irreversibly. Duchamp was a trickster. He was using simple objects from reality, elevating them to the rank of an art piece, and at the same time questioning its status as an art piece. What makes art art? What makes an object art? He was also playing with the artist persona, challenging the artist position and exposing all his com complexes and myths. We will we will be mentioning only one of one of his projects, that is 16 miles of a string. So Duchamp, 16 miles of string, created in 1942 for exhibition in the Philadelphia Museum of Art, was precisely what the title stated. It was 16 miles of string hung in the gallery with the with works of other artists so that it was impossible to enter the actual hall. It was an installation where the string filled the space and manifested itself in its purest form. The experience of the string was immediate. There was no illusion, no depiction, no particular convention, no imitation, a clear manifestation of a string in a specific space, overpowering and direct. And again, the, the Duchamp was, as a trickster referred to the conventional way of participating in exhibitions, stiff and big headed audience, critics and artists and judging and ruling in the galleries, etc. So still Duchamp through a simple act and a consistent gesture turned around the situation. Is the room the piece of art? No entry? Maybe the audience is a piece of art. Perhaps the string is some sort of a manifesto. All those questions are reasonable and legitimate, of course, but I don't think that the trickster will allow this continuously room filling string to answer them. The trickster only giggles in the corner, just like a f just 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 as he does because he's a trickster. And if you are not familiar with the persona or the figure of a trickster, research it because it's an Another, I would say, myth that you can look through a history of art. No? We, mm, if we if don't you, have time. No, if you, but if you want to um, choose a trickster strategy, be very, very careful. Because we're going to be very, very uh, 
how to say it? Trickster. Uh, Trickster is not silly. He's not stupid. It's not, it's not silly. It's not stupid. He's yeah. the most intelligent person in the room. <laughs> but he laughs at everybody, and he knows he knows why he's laughing. Yeah, there, there would have to be a necessity behind uh, uh, creating such a concept. There has yeah. to be a reason. Yeah, 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 that's for sure. Uh, he's a well known for his profound ultramarine blue monochrome works, the Blue Epoch. He consciously chose this specific color, knowing its direct reference to lapis lazuli, which was used, for example, to paint the Madonna's robes, medieval paintings, etc. But our primary focus in this particular example of artistic practice is his performances, which have relied on submerging a live model in his developed ultramarine blue and paint with her body on the canvas, placed on the ground or on the wall. Here you have an example, uh, more of a, a printmaking rather than an actual painting, but here we have a much wider gesture. And again, a combination of the most simple simple symbols the paint in the artist's mind it might have been the ultimate color and the human body with all its contexts and history on the one hand Klein's gesture was primal and even might have been considered obscene but on the other the purest the most simple juxtaposition the human body and the ultimate substance we might say that he enclosed the whole tradition of art in that one gesture the act of painting painting the model with the model, the symbolism of color, the illusion of flat surface, etc. Uh, Klein raised questions about the condition of art and its tradition as a medium of communication. With his gesture, he exposed the illusion of imitations on a flat surface. He questioned, just like Duchamp, the status of artwork, artwork, but in his case, by multiplying the same color in all of his canvases and installations, since his first monochrome from 1949 until, until his untimely death in 1962. Uh, and it needs to be said, because Anya pointed, out, point, pointed it out to me, that today the, his strategy for those happenings might have been read as revolting, misogynistic, and as a perfect example of male chauvinism, especially in the field of modern art and the community of artists, but I, but I beg to differ. <laughs> One of Klein's works may indicate that he treated all the bodies, male, female, even his own body, as a tool, but as a tool that allows him to build his metaphors, statements, and questions about reality. It's a different, I would say that it's a different way of thinking, that you, you, are, you, you respect the tool that you are working with by deeply understanding it, it its substance and its context. It context. In his one of most is in his one of most famous works, Leap into the Void, 1960. He uses himself as the model for the photography and puts himself in for all the danger and the consequences of that leap. Uh, the potential of the metaphor in the human body and use it consciously throughout his practice. And in, for me, this is the example that that uh, Klein wasn't a chauvinist. Uh, and he wasn't a uh, 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 misogynist. That's how you say it. Something like that, because he he was he was using body as a tool, all all bodies, even even his own body. But of course, time changes the world. The world changes through time. We are more aware as a society. Setting the foundation for our cooperation for this week, we would like to show you some more recent artists and their performances with movement, gesture, and drawing. So, first of all, Nietzsche Hines uh, did a project called Drawing Dancing. And as the artist herself states in the description of her work, Drawing Dancing is a short experimental animation that sits between visual and performing art, employing a body language positioned between choreography and combat. We seem to be watching a mysterious exchange between the drawing and the dancer, and I will copy that link and paste it to you so that you can watch the. Oh, where is it? Here it is. So that you can watch her animation. The animation is not the best word because the best word because she was uh, making a photo shoot uh, and just put all the frames as a as a moving picture. Uh, <laughs> But it is good. for me, it's an interesting uh, example of 
on one hand, the conflict that we can see between a line and a human figure, and on the, and on the other, there's a, there's a strange balance that they, they are trying to walk, they are trying to work with one another, and they are trying to find this point of balance where they can uh, function together in this short period of time. That's what I, I, would, I would say. Uh, next one is Caroline uh, Denervot. I'm sorry, I'm, I don't know. I don't know how to spell, to spell her uh, last name. She's a, a, her performative drawings are much more formal in their construction. I would I would say that it's a, just a simple gesture, an impulse on on the wall, and it is as if she allows her body to be controlled by the drawing. She holds poses that seem to echo the shapes and forms required by the emerging image, her body becoming an aesthetic fit as she responds to the demands of the drawing. So that's a different, it's almost the same as what, the, what the, the previous artist did, but she's working with dance moves and she refers here to combat. And what Caroline, Caroline is doing here is that she is becoming uh she's relying and she's moving you know in such a way that she's moving in a way that is defined by the drawing so i i i, I thought that it's worth mentioning for you and uh, here's a different example from uh, caroline's practice uh in a much more enclosed space and guys of course you need to remember you are you are the masters of the project and you can do whatever you want sky is the limit the more the more enclosed space is maybe the better for your idea the more open the space is maybe maybe that's the that will be the key element of the idea my point here is that, that again sky is the limit and you need you need to think in an open way and matter okay molly hustling that's a nice uh, very nice uh, attempt as as a drawing space but very simple in theory uh, and there's a there's an actual tool, uh, a compass. So I will read out read out loud what what Molly stated about her project. My performance circles can easily be understood as a med med meditative act. It includes repetition, and one revolves round one's own center, becomes dizzy, and to some extent disoriented. One will have to just focus on drawing the circles. Initially, I probably imagined that I would embark on this alone, but then it becomes like a closed work, merely focused on the performer and the mystical, yet I'd find it sad or boring if the possibility to break the space wasn't, wasn't an option. So the focus is on the physical action, on the movement of the circles and the patterns emerging and disappearing again. And of course, the effect grows with the number of participants. On the other hand, if you want to draw alone, you can just with, withdraw a little from the rest, a bit like on the dance floor. And again, here's the link. Uh, and I will send it to you on chat. So that you can uh, see it for yourself, because playing with videos on streaming platforms never works. So maybe this time I will give you some some time because it's a it's a longer video than than the previous one so write me a message on the chat when you when you will be done okay yes okay okay so let's move on because we have a schedule okay and next is tony orico my favorite. <laughs> Anya's favorite. Uh, and I would say that my one of my favorites as well, it, it, when you when we are thinking about drawing as a gesture in on a, on a surface in space, I would say. Why is it not? Yeah. Here you have a link to his site with photos and videos. You can you can watch them later. But Tony's example is is an example uh that is much more i would say universal and open to interpretation and to relate relate to on a very 
personal level, but maybe not aesthetic level. Because there's a different artist, I, a different artist, I can't remember her name, I have her here some, somewhere. Oh, here she is, but you cannot see her. Uh, Heather Hansen. It's a different kind of approach. I can also copy paste the link. But what Hansen does uh, is that she relies on a symmetrical and a very aesthetic way of work, maybe not working, but uh, the, fi the, fi the final effect of her works focus primarily on aesthetics, I would say. And what Tony does is that he is more focused on the concept of exploring a certain very narrow uh, idea to the fore to show the possibilities of that particular movement to the fore. Uh, whereas um, Heather Hansen is more um, sort of from the dance uh, area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she, she comes. Uh, so, uh, so if you have this movement that is based on dance, that uh, you know you have a certain sequence of movements uh, that are uh, well pre-designed for for space, and she turns it into uh, into a drawing that has this aesthetical value high in priorities. Yeah. And with uh, with Tony, it's more uh, about the exploration of the minutest possible change of a certain uh, concept, certain idea. And I would say that it's also about the limitations of the body, uh, yeah. because what Tony does as well, and you can see it in some of his videos, that he's a, he he developed a different way of holding a pen. And on one hand, I think that it restricts him from being comfortable with the tool, but on the other, it f allows him to. Uh, work with that pen in a very neutral matter that almost that is un, un, it, it's not influenced by the aesthetics but just the raw energy of the gesture of the wrist for example that's how I would put it he holds it like this there's a different there's a different when you look at the videos there's a different uh, method every I think almost every single time but I'm not works. sure like that he developed it I mean we use it like Everything. But there is a there is a different for way cer for certain reasons, you know, when, yeah. you're, when you're aware of your drawing, you know, which type of hold of a tool you need for a cer certain effect, you know, and he's using it very, very consciously. And this is also an example for you that sometimes you need to think outside of the box, even in such a basic matter like holding a tool. And I really encourage you to to look through uh, Tony's uh, uh, website and his documentation because it is mind blowing. And this is a good 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 pretext to talk about the the, the idea of conceptualism, what it might be, because I I know that those practices might may may appear to you as a simple and a little bit alien and difficult to understand or relate to and especially in his works uh, the the great advantage of his works is the clarity you know clarity of how he delivers the idea that you don't have you you don't have to look for the uh, why and how and whatnot it's all clearly visible and this is done because of this very uh, through this very rigorous discipline that he designs first and then he performs. He designs the, the, the stages of every single step. And this, uh, and this is, you know, uh, something that is very important and something that you should very much focus on. Uh, uh, many of you, I don't know, we, we don't know the reasons why you have chosen the workshop <laughs> with us, but it was all clearly said. Uh, in the in the description uh, that you need to develop the, your individual way of work, and by that we uh, understand that it's going to be uh, um, consistent. There's going to be some necessity in it, like an inner necessity in it. Yeah, uh, that you need to have a reason for doing something. 
it's not the workshop that is going to allow you to do anything because just anything. You need to have a reason to do this specific anything that you want to do. That's why we left the in the description, we, we left the form of the final piece uh, absolutely open for you to design. Uh, we're going to go through the warm-up exercises that are different kinds of drawings, different kinds of feelings in the body as well. I would say that in this lecture we theoretically went step by step through detaching the drawing from the surface of paper and those exercises today and maybe tomorrow, it mm -hmm. depends how we will be able to to, re to to finalize our schedule. Now it's in the practical aspect of detach slowly, step by step, detaching the drawing from the surface of the mm -hmm. of the paper and going into space. And uh, the uh, key factor that is going to be guiding you through this workshop that is a future text workshop uh, and that is performative uh, arts uh, workshop. Keep those two things in mind. Uh, is the text or in other words a communication that you want to give so you have a text and the thing that you're going to do in relation to this text yeah that you're going to try to create and your your uh, actually your uh priority task for today and tomorrow apart from warm-up exercises the sequence of them and all the things that you're going to experience is to figure out like what you want to say do you have a favorite quote do you uh, uh what do you want to comment on do you have an opinion or something or maybe so, th maybe there's a quote that you hate and that you want to face yes there's a, some relation some emotion some relation and uh to be ready tomorrow when you are, uh, you will be showing us also the, the map, but we're going to take, talk about the map later uh, uh, after the warm up uh, exercises. But that you would be uh, able to present us with the concept, with the idea, with the what you want to do in context of this text. So uh, now is the time to ask a questions. Uh, uh, about all this, because it's uh, it's very important that we are all clear on this, and we are uh, also aware that it, it doesn't have to be uh, easy for you to understand what we uh, uh, propose uh, to do and what we want you to do. Because again, this is this is a different way of thinking. This is a, an additional perspective that you can work with. That I, I called I called it a conceptual more conceptual approach and conceptualism as a movement in art is very it seems very uh, difficult to read to relate to again uh, but it's because it's so simple and so pure because it, fo it focuses sometimes on very simple logic very simple relation that we can observe in the world and it focuses on it to to, to, to say something, to, to, again, to show another perspective in the infinite horizon of the perspective, all objective and subjective perspective. Mm -hmm. And I was, we, were, we were talking about this with Anya, that conceptualism doesn't mean abstract, that conceptualism doesn't mean that it's something uh, that is fully, integrally subjective and it's my artistic world and we don't understand it. That's not how it works. It's like, as Anya said, it, said, said it a few, few moments ago, that there's an idea, there's a method, there's a rigid structure of steps that you design, that you have to deliver and perform to f manifest, to materialize the concept. Everything is thought through. The, probably this, this, the, mo the, 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 the more simple the idea, the better, because when it gets more and more complex, then it demands more and more work and more and more elements and more and more thought that everything time is time to realize and, time. You know, and we have like so basically we'll be working uh today and tomorrow morning there will be the warm-up exercises then tomorrow we're going you're going to see uh you're going to show us the uh, uh your map uh your movement map and you're going to present us with the concept of uh of the idea each of you we are going to all be listening to it this is going to be uh, like a meeting of us all together and since well, this workshop was uh, initially designed for uh, 10 participants, but there were many of you interested. 
Uh, so you need to realize that it's going to take some time of the day tomorrow. And then you have, uh, you have Wednesday and, and Thursday to actually execute it. Since, as you heard during the opening lecture, uh, uh, you should be ready by 11 a.m. Uh, with your materials. Yeah, and during the workshop, you will be uploading to the link uh, um, to the Google Drive I linked uh, in my first post in this group. Uh, you, each of you, please create your own folder for the warm up exercises, divide them, uh, make, uh, create subfolders for, for each of the exercise, and then you'll be uploading the, uh, your final materials for. Uh, uh, also the materials from the process. Yeah, as you know from, from our classes, the process is very important <laughs> for, for us to discuss. And when it comes to the final work, you're going to be proposing what it is, which is it to be, what is it to be, can be video, can be, uh, can be in urban space, can be in your place, uh, can be in any place that you can uh, work in, can be in the, in the park, uh, uh, it's good if you would have a reason to choose a particular environment to express a certain thought, a certain idea, um, that if you could discover it, why you want to do it there, yeah, and gave that reason. And uh, as for now, uh, um, how we imagine the final presentation to be, we're going to pick some of the um, warm-up exercises uh, uh, works, uh, to, to present them, uh, uh, to, to, well, to do an introduction, mm -hmm. and then we are going to be presenting your your project. There will be a quote and either the photo of your final work or a video of your final work, uh, something of the kind. So do you have any questions? Does the final work have to be in black ink or could it be in a different color? So, Emilia, you design it. Okay, so if I did it even like in hot pink, that would be fine. <laughs> Amelia, when you use paint, you need to have a very specific reason for that. And yeah, I'm just asking. Yeah, I'm, no, oh. but well, if you will justify it and explain it to us and it, and it makes sense, why not? But we need to be aware of that. Uh, color also, the colors give you additional meaning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was just making sure, like in case if I decided to maybe want to use a different color, then that will be fine if I just justify it. Yeah, but if you if you if you propose a, a, an idea, thought, thought through sketches or maybe some samples, what you mean by the usage of color, then and it works, it clicks. Why not? You can use lipstick. You can use sand. You can use like whatever draws a line. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Tie hair together. Use hair. Yeah. Oh, there is really also this artist nice. that that works with hair. I forgot to put her into the presentation. <laughs> no, but guys, it's like uh, so. So uh, obviously, the starting point should be uh, some text that interests you. Yeah, that you have some relation to, that is meaningful to you. It can be yeah. a quote. It can be a single sentence it can be a single word word but in, in, in quotes that even one word and the signature of the person that that stated that that quote also builds context right context yeah. right remember about that so if it's a book then you need to come up with the uh, justification i mean you need to tell why this book what this book this book is about what the meaning does it carry yeah and uh, if you want to work in such a big reference, but small quotes, good quotes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like very much, much easier, you know? If you take Ulysses, the book, <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> that might be a little bit tricky. We don't have much time for that. <laughs> it would so, be a whole 30-day seminar to talk about Ulysses. <laughs> <laughs> 